speaker here um, so that we don't lose a lot of time. Um, so, hi, Antonio, nice to meet you. Uh, Antonio here uh, is from Argonne National Lab. And uh, he is uh, one of the folks that have been recognized for um, uh, Early Career Achievement Award uh, for uh, innovative use of NERSC resources. And uh, he's going to be talking to us today about uh, the work that he did using Corey k &L, um, uh, for the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, LSST uh, used to be called Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. I think it's what the legacy survey of space and time now. Um, so um, please uh, go ahead. Um, the recording, uh, the, the, I think, as you probably heard, the, the talk is being recorded and um, with your permission, we'll be uh, sharing this after, um, after the talk's over, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I um, guess, let me share a screen now. Sure. Okay, let me just make looks, sure. Looks Good great. Everyone. Yes. Okay. So, as I said, uh, I'm Antonio Virea. I'm a postdoctoral appointee at Argonne National Lab. This is my first postdoc. Um, and I'll be talking today about the uh, LSST desk second data challenge image simulation campaign with parallel Python workflows, including what all that uh, name salad is. Oh, God, is it auto advancing on me? I can fix that. Um, so, the way I've structured this is I've kind of focused on a couple of big questions. Um, First, what is the Vera Rubin Observatory LSST Desk Second Data Challenge Simulation Campaign, which I realize is a huge mess of words if you're not particularly following that already. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we start from essentially nothing and create simulated telescope quality images that are designed to be indistinguishable from the sort of images that we expect to be taking with the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, and then because we, of course, here care about high performance computing, I'm going to talk about how we're going to turn this into a scalable and also portable workflow. Um, finally, going to move on to talking about what did we learn about all of this for the future? Um, what are the next steps for both uh, the parcel team, uh, the IMSIM team that's doing this image simulation, as well as for um, uh, just sort of general LSST desk goals. And I was asked to, uh, to talk a little bit about what is this all like as a first round postdoc um, with, in my ex personal opinion, very little experience, but that might be the imposter syndrome talking. So um, I'll talk a bit about that. So let's start by talking about what the Vera Rubin Observatory LSST second data challenge in simulation campaign is and why I had to make this section header so dang long. Um, so to the left, you can see uh, an image of the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's a large telescope being built in Chile for the purpose of doing a survey of the entire night sky. Um, admittedly, it's been slowed down uh, considerably over the years, um, most recently by the pandemic, but we're still expecting to see uh, first light in the next year or so. Um, so what does this image simulation campaign entail? Um, the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to be taking a, as I was saying, a survey of the entire night sky over the course of 10 years. And it's been identified as one of the most important observational tasks for the field of astrophysics. And in particular, many science collaborations have sort of built around it in order to try to figure out how to leverage the information as best as they possibly can before the telescope is ever operational. Uh, the Dark Energy Science Collaboration is the largest of these groups, and our focus is on the study of dark energy, unsurprisingly. Um, we added on dark matter, but uh, we haven't updated the name of our collaboration and probably won't. Um, so pretend dark matter is there too. Uh, so this is going to be an unprecedented amount of data in the field of astrophysics. Um, this telescope essentially surveys the entire night sky once every three nights. That's an enormous amount of data. And over the course of the entire observational run, it will be generating petabytes of data. It is auto advancing on me. It'll be close enough. Um, so uh, our focus here is studying the cosmology of the universe. Um, we want to see how the universe has evolved over time. And the result of that has sort of become uh, codified as the standard cosmology of the universe. 
Uh, the plot to your right is Planck, uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background with temperature fluctuations um, mapped out as a function of angular scale on the sky. And what you can see is that these have error points. They're very, very tiny. It's a very high precision experiment. And you can fit that very, very complicated signal with only seven cosmological parameters, which is a little absurd in some ways. And so that's sort of become codified in this lambda cold dark matter cosmology. The lambda is dark energy. Cold dark matter means it's dark matter that doesn't move very fast. Um, and that while tensions do exist with this model, um, it's very difficult to find models that can address all of the data that we have in the universe simultaneously and just fit. So the desk, this dark energy science collaboration wants to understand the evolution of the universe. If you've been to a cosmology talk, you've seen the pie chart on the right countless times. This one's from Astro Katie on Twitter, who's a fantastic science communicator. Um, Universe is made of 5% visible matter that we can see, 27% strange gravitational attraction that we call dark matter, and roughly 70% strange gravitational repulsion that we call dark energy. And like I said, that model fits incredibly well. So we wanna find, is this the correct model or does the model break down somewhere? Uh, Mira Rubin Observatory lets us basically push on that by pushing down the statistical errors considerably but in turn, we also need to push down the systematic errors. We have to be really sure that we're not having any systematics that will throw us off because we're measuring very small deviations at this point. To test this, we need, well, we have a uh, survey of unprecedented scale. So we're going to need simulations of unprecedented scale as well. And so that brings us to the data challenges that LSST Desk has been doing, culminating in data challenge two. Oh, now you don't want to advance on me? OK, so DC2. It's Data Challenge 2. It's a very large simulation. The panel on the left, uh, all that red area is the uh, part of the sky that we expect LSST to be covering. That small teal square is the uh, Data Challenge 2 survey area. It's 300 square degrees of the night sky covered for five years of depth. Um, it has a wide fast deep component, which will be enabling large scale structure studies. Um, that's just area that's covered with the normal LSST cadence. And then there's going to be a deep drilling field in which we hit these same areas over and over and over again in order to enable transient studies through objects such as supernova or quasars that change over time. Um, it's being done in six bands of colors that matches up with the telescope exactly so that this will essentially be giving us the exact outputs we expect from the real telescope, but entirely simulated. So how do we start from nothing and end up at simulated telescope quality images? It's a not trivial task. Um, turns out it's pretty long and complicated. We start with just these seven cosmological parameters that I was talking about previously and some other junk. Um, and we put it into a numerical simulation um, run essentially with only gravity. And from that, we can see how dark matter structures in the universe. Uh, from the, where we know that galaxies live in the center of these dark matter structures. So we can take where the structures are located. We can take observational data we have from other surveys on how galaxies look and plug it all together to make a catalog full of galaxies in the universe. We can then take another code and tell it in our you know, theoretical survey of the night sky, if a telescope is pointed in this direction, which of these extra galactic objects do we see? Um, how much air is the telescope looking through? Where are the Milky Way stars? What's the dust looking like? And so we can put that all into a single output that is called an instance catalog. And this catalog is basically everything that our image simulation code needs in order to simulate a telescope quality image. It's basically telling where all the galaxies are, what you're looking through, et cetera. And so that brings us finally to our core application that this high performance computing campaign is on, which is IMSIM. Um, IMSIM oh, so, is- hi, Antonio, this is Richard. I finally joined. I'm sorry about that. Could, do you mind oh. if I ask a question on your previous slide? Uh, sure, feel free. So um, where do you think the biggest uh, potential source of 
of error uncertainty is um, going from the upper left to the bottom right? So there is a lot of small things that could matter here. Um, probably for me, the biggest that I would be concerned about is there's a lot of fiddly noms when you're connecting from dark matter structures in a simulation to galaxies. Now, that being said, in our particular case, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, we don't need the universe to be correct in any real sense. We need it to be correct enough that people can run the science pipelines and see where things break. So we're never actually worried about them recovering this original cosmology. We're just worried that they can actually reasonably try. Um, it would be actually very exciting if they could recover the original cosmology, but we're not there yet. Um, but yeah, so really this halo galaxy connection is probably the biggest step for what you would uh, classify as an error. Um, but we basically designed it to uh, be as close to observation as possible for a lot of signatures so that people can test their science reliably. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we have our catalog of objects. We now have an image simulation code called imsim. It's essentially a Python code that builds off of an open source project called galsim. Um, and all that does is it takes that previous instance catalog we've said and now it takes all the information about the telescope and for every single sensor on your camera, it generates a single image for a single pointing of the telescope. Um, these are essentially real images from a telescope and the rest of this uh, pipeline is basically just how you would handle a telescope image. It's the LSST projects stack for how they process images off the camera and we, you know, let our raw images go through that, we get out our final stacked images, and that's essentially what everyone is expecting to do real science on anyway. And so we're getting that little step before that, and then just passing it over to what project is done essentially. Um, so how does that look in practice? Uh, so the image simulation, GalSim is handling the simulation of the objects under the hood. Uh, we have a Python code that handles the pointing of the telescope, simulation of lensing and dust, and simulation of extragalactic objects and stars. It's essentially a giant decision tree for extragalactic objects that chooses between many different possible methods from Fourier transforms to uh, ray tracing to determine the fastest way to draw objects while maintaining all the realism that we need. Um, but it's a very complicated decision tree. On your right is a image of the camera focal plane. Uh, so there's 189 gray boxes which are the individual sensors of the camera. We're generating an image for every single one of those gray bo boxes that has extragalactic objects on it. Um, and then once we've generated all those images, we can stack them together, um, process them, and get an image like the inset one, which is a real image that we've processed from DC2. And you can see from the size of the inset that it's a very tiny part of just one sensor. So we're just generating an enormous amount of data here um, for people to process. Okay, so that's roughly how this image simulation code works. Um, so how are we gonna end up turning this into a scalable and portable workflow because we want to leverage as many resources as we can. Uh, step one for us is containers. So why are we considering using containers when there's some overhead associated with them? Um, there's two major reasons. The first is that the underlying software we're using is pretty large and it was also being frequently iterated on. Uh, we need to basically bring in a lot of software that the LSST desk has developed. It's very many different people contributing to it, and so it can change frequently. Software uh, containers give us a way to basically lock all that software in place and make sure nothing changes on us unsurprise, you know, by surprise. Um, the other advantage is it lets us leverage compute resources across multiple sites with potentially different architectures. So while we generated the entire wide fast deep field here at uh, Cori. Um, we were also potentially looking at leveraging uh, for more, even more years, um, resources like Argon, uh, Argon Stata uh, uh, computer, um, as well as uh, even the UK grid, which has very, very different architecture by comparison. Um, so the way we ended up approaching this, we have an underlying Docker container. It's generated with everything we need to run MSIM on it. Um, and Shifter and Singularity can pull this container, go through their steps of rebuilding it as they need to, 
and give us something that we need to run the pipeline with as simple as a change of a couple of tags in our, our parcel workflow. Um, here's an example of one of the containers we use. Um, we basically pull in this LSST stack container um, as the baseline. It's very large. It's kind of a, you know, it, it's a lot. Um, and then we just add specific software on it. We tag it as well as possible um, so that we're using specific versions and can trace back things in case something, you know, goes wrong somewhere down the pipeline. And then we just, you know, tag our containers and we can pull them down by the tags into our parcel workflow. Um, that's all pretty straightforward. Uh, we have an entry point. We actually don't use it. We just send it commands. Um, parcel uh, allows us for the next step here. It's a parallel programming library for Python. And what Parcel does is it runs a driver process that then communicates with the compute nodes where you start up uh, worker processes. And these worker processes then communicate back to your driver and ask if it has any work for it. Um, Parcel uh, stores this work as what are called applications or, or just apps. And these are either Python commands or just an arbitrary bash command that you wanna execute. And whenever a worker is available, Parcel then distributes runtime to these applications. And when you know an application finishes, the worker says it's available for more work. This is important for us because of the plot you see here on the right, which is a distribution of sensor runtimes for the deep drilling field where we're only adding on transient objects. So this is like a tiny fraction of the total simulation time. But even there, you can see we have a, what, 15 minute difference um, in these two sort of modes, um, even on a one hour run. And so the runtime from sensor to sensor can be very significantly different based on the objects that you have to draw. Um, the wide fast deep field, these runs take 10 hours to simulate. And so it can be a two hour difference between sensors. And so it's very important for us to be able to keep cycling in work. And so we just cycle in new work when old work finishes. Um, we have checkpointing so that if the resource block cuts off early, we don't actually lose all that much and can just build off of that in the future. Um, it's not perfect because of reasons I'll come back to later, but it's uh, a way to ver leverage things much better than the naive approach. Sure. Yeah, so um, I guess I would call Parcel more of a, um, a workload manager or, um, or a parallel framework. I don't, know, I don't know what the right terminology is, but um, that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, that's what it uh, does. It it has a lot of similarities. Um, I would I usually call it a workflow manager in a lot of ways because you're just generating a list of work and Parcel is handling how it gets handled out. Um, but it also has some parallel programming sense to it because it's not actually you don't have to use like MPI to connect everything. Um, it uses I think ZMQ under the hood for the uh, high throughput executors. Um, so it's it's a little a little strange in some ways, but you can use it to start um, tasks on 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 multiple nodes within yes, a job, right? Exactly. Um, so the way these apps work, just I'm going to say this because I, I kind of love Parcel for how simple it is for someone like me. Uh, you have two ways of doing it; they're both decorators. Um, you have Python apps, which are basically just a decorator under around a Python definition with a uh, list of ex, uh, optional arguments that can tell you where to run it, how many of these you get to run at a time, et cetera. Um, and you know, you just write normal Python code and it, you know, whenever you call that, uh, Parcel knows that it has work to do and distributes it out to a worker and then waits for it to finish. Um, but you can also do what we did most of the time, which was bash apps. Um, essentially same thing, it's a decorator. But now all you're doing is returning a string, which is the command you want to execute on a node. And so we just give it a big, huge, complicated uh, uh, container command. Um, the wrapper for the container is changed based on uh, which uh, machine we're on. And it just fires up containers with all the work we need it to do for a single uh, observation. The final step in our workflow is just bundler scripts. Um, so we need to balance a couple of needs. The plot on the left shows the Cori and Theta memory limits uh, for a single node. 
and the black line is just a image of how, ooh, don't know why that's going so fast. Uh, black line is just an image of uh, how quickly, uh, gosh, I wish I could kill the timings on this. Gotta just pause it here. Um, the black line is just a, uh, for as you scale up the number of sensors, sensors, how does the memory footprint go? And so we never really get to leverage full hyper-threading with this sort of uh, setup just due to the way that we've set up the code, um, but we're really memory bound. Uh, so we're, what we have right is a bundler that's trying to balance a couple of needs. Each container has some memory footprint associated with it because of its bulk. Um, multiple sensors from a single telescope visit can actually share some overall memory because they're all looking through the same night sky. We can share that among sensors, even though it's parallelized around sensors. Um, each sensor has some average memory footprint, um, which is what we pl plotted here. But there's a caveat to this, which is individual objects because they're going through this decision tree. Ray tracing takes a lot less memory than a Fourier transform, for example. And so sometimes the sensor will get stuck on an object that takes a really long time and a really large memory footprint. And you have to sort of give some wiggle room to account for that in case all like a large number of sensors do that all simultaneously. And we don't have a really good way to model this because it's a very complicated distribution of objects and it's a very complex decision tree. And so we don't have a sense ahead of time how much memory a sensor is going to use, unfortunately. Um, especially not at a given time. So we, we have scripts that essentially just take all this information into account and create bundles of commands. And these are just the singularity or shifter commands that are going to be gen uh, executed on the compute node. And now we you know, generate a whole bunch of Python apps of that and just fire them all off. And that's how we uh, run our workflow. Uh, the result looks kind of like this. We have 189 sensors, roughly 30,000 catalogs, so huge amount of work. We bundle them up as much as efficiently as possible, and then we just send them off to Theta or Cori compute nodes as necessary and uh, generate millions of core hours of synthetic sky surveys. Um, whenever a compute node runs out of work, there's almost certainly new work to shove in until toward the end of the run. And then we just kind of scale it down and how much resources we're um, requesting at one time in order to minimize how much uh, uh, wasted compute we have. Uh, the final result, here's one of those images of uh, the final process data from Cosmo, or sorry, from DC2. Um, we were able to use 100 million plus compute hours. It's a little hard to measure exactly how much that is because we did have to redo some things as uh, people um, uh, on both sides realized, oh, but we need to change this to make the simulation a little better or we're missing this. And so we did have to regenerate some files. Uh, we were able to use up to 2000 nodes simultaneously on Cori. Um, I do wanna note that this isn't really a lower or an upper limit. Um, we were able to scale it up more on Theta, but we tried to aim toward this 2000 core window, uh, node window in order to uh, optimize getting through the queue as fast as possible. Um, so there's sort of balance there. And because of our checkpointing, it doesn't really hurt us to have multiple 2000 queue jobs and Parcel can manage that. Um, five year depth of LSST was simulated for our region, so fantastic. And there's multiple desk projects already using this information for science preparation. Um, they're processing this data, studying it, um, seeing how their science pipelines will work. And we're already starting to get feedback on that. I, I, where is the, uh, Tony, oh, sorry. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask where, where the data resides and how do they get it? Um, that's a uh, data. I had to take this in two parts. I'm pretty sure most of the data lives on Quarry, and we have it uh, archived away um, on NERSC uh, tape. Um, we also have a DC2 open access portal, um, which I did not link anywhere in the talk, but it exists, um, where we do uh, allow access to a subset of the total data for mm -hmm. anyone who wants it, because it is fairly public. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to ask two quick questions about this slide and the last slide. On the, on the previous one, you mentioned wasted compute. Is that mostly coming from load imbalance? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the issue. So um, it's, it's this difference in time that runs can take of up to two hours. And because we're parallelizing on, for a given pointing of the telescope, we parallelize over the sensors. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have a particularly smart way to keep a node just completely filled at all times. Mm -hmm. um, Did so you have any any strategies at all, like order? Can you play with ordering like the longest ones first or something? Uh, so the problem there is we don't have a inherent sense of what objects will take long, long yeah, okay. amounts of time. Uh, we do have an approach. I'll come back to that when I talk about future things that might. Uh, mitigate this, though. Sounds like a uh, deep learning problem for you, Ron. And, and then a second real quick uh, question, which was on the next slide, where you said uh, that you needed to iterate a little bit, right? That um, as people kind of realized that what was going into the simulation, like, needed to change or, like, parameters needed. Um, was there much, like, um, interactive tuning of that pipeline chain? Are you able to do that interactively? Or is it, like, not really, you have to regenerate configuration and rerun and wait and like keep track in your notebook of what you were doing. Yeah, the unfortunate uh, nature of the beast here is it basically almost always requires a complete rerun. Mm -hmm. um, because if one object changes on the uh, camera, it basically should change other objects on the camera and we don't have a good way of changing that on the fly. The mm -hmm. other downside to this is a lot of things don't get recognized until you process the data and the uh, processing stack needs to have a large amount of the data already handed to it for it to give any sort of real results. Mm -hmm. So we basically okay. had to partly complete runs before people could even look at it to validate it. Right, okay, thanks. No problem. Um, okay, so I promised to talk a bit about the future. Perfect time. So, so we have a couple of lessons we learned in particular that I want to draw attention to. Um, the first is actually not anything we ran against at NERSC, but is worth mentioning from a HPC standpoint, which is the parcel driver. It can become disconnected. Um, typically in our use cases, it was run on a login node. Um, and if the login node goes down for any reason, parcel driver goes down too. And then when your workers launch on a compute resource, they look for the parcel driver and cannot find it. It's very tragic. The workers then just sit on the compute node doing nothing. Everyone is very sad. Um, our takeaway from this was that it would be useful for us for, to do a couple of things. The first thing is we did a very quick solution, which is we ran the parcel driver on the compute resources. Since we can tell the parcel driver everything it's going to need to do in advance, we didn't really need to keep it running on a login node anyway. Um, that does mean it can't communicate across compute blocks, and that's sort of a bummer, but uh, mm. it works to first order. Um, however, um, we are very interested in making parcel work on more stable workflow nodes, uh, which I know a lot of centers, including NERSC, are looking into. Um, and we're also looking into using it on remote cloud services. So in particular, um, one of the other people who worked on this project a lot, uh, Yadu, um, was exploring running this on, running your parcel driver on Amazon Cloud Services, for example. And from Amazon Cloud Services, you would then send out jobs um, to different compute resources that you've SSH'd into and authorized. And so you could conceivably be running this large simulation campaign and um, distributing the work on the fly to Corey and Theta and I don't know, Summit, all while, you know, as soon as resources become available, you know, just fill it up with work and just basically utilize many different resources simultaneously while tracking a shared provenance. Um, it's exciting. It's complicated. It probably has a lot of problems because of this SSH authorization and security reasons for things like compute nodes at a at uh, Argon, for example, compute, I, compute nodes in Argon aren't connected to the internet. Um, but it's interesting. 
Um, another thing we want to explore is containers. We know that they work, but there's probably some costs associated with this that we should study further. Um, in our case, because the average runtime on a given sensor is like 10 hours, a 10 minute startup time on a container, even if it's that slow, doesn't really kill us. Um, but it would be good to compare in the future um, how that startup time compares to time oh. saved on, say, loading in Python libraries. Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yep. Did you say your container jobs take 10 minutes to launch? No, that was me being hyperbolic. It does not take 10 minutes to launch. I've seen, I mean, I've seen full KNL runs where it was 90 seconds and that was kind of the worst at that scale. So it, it really, really should not be anywhere near 10 minutes. Part of the yeah, reason yeah. it exists is so, I mean, okay. All right. So, yeah, you're, so we're, you're we're just, expecting around okay. a minute. We're expecting <laughs> right, around good. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> good. Um, but basically my point is it's a tiny fraction of the total compute time for us. So we're not too worried about that, but it's still interesting for uh, when we're running faster code in the future. Um, heck, where, what was I saying? Um, the other thing we're worried about is things like um, when we're using uh, containers in order to load in all our Python libraries, are we actually losing from running optimized Python libraries for particular architectures? And is there a way we can work around that? So that's the sort of thing we'd like to explore uh, in the future on the container side of things. Um, and then, like I said, this parallelizing within each visit does lose us some compute, especially toward the end of a simulation effort, um, just due to specific slow sensors. Um, in earlier runs, actually, before we had every uh, everything hammered out, we actually had sensors that would just never finish, which um, was distressing. Um, so the IMSIM team is actually doing some work in this direction, which is exploring how to parallelize uh, within the sensor. So you lose some uh, memory um, because now instead of sharing the sky memory from sensor to sensor for a single visit, you're now to get telling a node, please simulate this one sensor from this one visit. And now for every thread, you have the thread draw separate objects simultaneously. Um, there's reasons to believe that that might actually be a little more appropriate because it's not like the light from each object reaches us in single file line. Um, so doing them simultaneously might make more sense. Um, but it also means that uh, you'll have less of a variation on a given file. Interesting. So um, I'm not, it's up to date. This is others on the call so they can comment, but um, you know, each job is, is, is as far, as far as Storm is concerned, is a, is a reservation of some sort. And yep. I, I know there's some either capability or potential capability in Storm to be able to release nodes if, if you don't need them anymore within a job. Does that, does that capability certain exist currently? Does anybody know? I know I've seen that for Slurm, but I thought my understanding was you were still charged for nodes you released. Uh, yeah, this is Zengzi. So I know the capability in Slurm exists now. So you can release the nodes you don't need anymore. It's called job resizing. So once you're released, then those will not be charged. Yeah. So this is a, not going to be an uncommon use case, I think, in the future. And so um, it's something we should, we, we should look into, you know, if there's some there's some idiosyncrasies around how you would track it for charging. I'm sure it's something we could try to look at um, going forward. Yeah, if, if you're not charged for resize nodes, I'll uh, communicate that with the parcel team. I think they'll be yeah. interested in how we might resize on the fly. Yeah, I don't actually know. So that's, I will have to invest, we'll have to investigate that, um, I think. And then the other comment I made is about the, the idea of having a, a driver or the you know command ship that is in the cloud or whatever um, is an interesting one, um, but what it needs to do, as you point out, is basically communicate with whatever resource it's using in some way and and deal with all the credentials and auth authentication and authorization and transport mechanisms and everything. But in a certain sense, that's not that different than um, what people are trying to do with continuous integration and other type of things mm -hmm. like that. So. I wonder if there might be some commonality or some uh, 
some economy of scale or coordination that would, would help everybody. Do you have any knowledge of the uh, super facility API project that we're doing at NERSC? That might be a way that an external workflow manager could uh, transmit its work into NERSC. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that, but I uh, could pass that along to Yadu. I think he'd be pretty interested if you uh, can send me that information. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So what will the future bring for us? Uh, honestly, at this point, we need to see. Um, LSST desk members are utilizing these data products to validate their scientific pipelines. And we're looking into using this sort of workflow as a basis for other things within the collaboration from image production to, uh, um, and by image production, I mean processing the images now, um, to actually doing scientific theory pipelines. But we're not sure if, we're done. Um, we don't know if this simulation has reached the point where it's good enough um, or if we'll need to do smaller simulations that are more detailed. Um, we're pretty sure we won't need a larger simulation than this. Um, we think for most cases where you might care about a larger signal, we can just um, kind of cheat and just duplicate the edges. Um, but we might need a smaller and more detailed simulation um, with more complicated transient objects. Um, so we might have future simulation efforts, but we're really in a wait and see mo mode for LSST desk at this point. Um, there's no immediate plans for DC3 is my quick way of saying all of this. Um, so final thing, what was it like doing this as a first round postdoc? Um, so I just wanna say my background coming into all of this is I'm an astrophysics theorist. Um, I worked with numerical simulation outputs and studied weird cosmological effects. Um, very niche stuff that seven people probably cared about in the world. Um, so even though I'd used high performance computing systems before at uh, University of Pittsburgh, um, gosh, I don't know what it's named anymore. They keep changing it on me, um, but they have a small supercomputer cluster there. Is that Bridges? Is, is that what it's called now? Uh, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> well, I guess it's Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Um, yeah. And I, I, think, I think Bridges is one of the systems they had. Yeah. Um, anyway, basically, I had every new skill to acquire for running jobs at scale on HPC. Um, when I came into this project, it looked like it was basically supposed to be the uh, mediator between computing people and science people to make sure everything gets done correctly. Um, I started doing much more compute over time as, you know, I kind of fell into it. Um, lows of, of this all, um, we did have some wasted computing time at some points um, just due to various coding bugs. Um, and like I said previously, we didn't discover errors upstream that meant we had to run the simulations again. Um, Simple things like sign errors can slip very easily when it's such a long and complicated pipeline. And so we had to do a lot of validation and then rerunning and validation. Um, personal highs, um, I really liked when the waste the compute time canceled that with some of these upstream errors because it made me feel a lot less guilty um, for the environment. Um, and then I'm, I'm really happy with the recognition from within the collaboration and from outside of it for infrastructure work, because honestly, a lot of times infrastructure work just kind of gets pushed under the radar in science and academia. So um, it's nice to see that we're starting to appreciate it more as a community. Um, and how does it feel now? Because it's been on my fourth year of my postdoc now because of uh, COVID. Um, it was hard and rewarding, but I have tool sets now that can be applicable basically anywhere. Um, I can take this parcel tool set and just take it wherever I want and be able to run on a high performance computing system fairly easily. Um, because it's all Python level, that makes it very, very uh, uh, multifaceted. Um, I contributed enough on this infrastructure effort to get uh, builder status in LSST desk. Um, so that's another big thumbs up for me. Um, and I love the mission of it because I'm really interested in understanding the evolution of the universe personally. And um, because of this project, I basically have gained a really good understanding of how parcel works, how to use high performance computing systems. And I think that that will help me personally to 
move in a more informed manner for developing future projects and eventually proposing my own projects probably. Um, and so I look forward to seeing how I can leverage these tools for future computing efforts and understanding the evolution of the universe. Um, so hard and rewarding. I, I'll admit a little bit, I'm impatient. I am not a patient person. Um, I want to see the results now and see how my contributions built into that. Um, and I'm stuck waiting because it takes time. Telescope's not started yet. Uh, maybe in the future, I'll have to get a computing project with more immediate results as opposed to a telescope that I still have to wait for it to run 10 years. Um, but I'm super excited to see what the collaboration does with these simulations. And it'll be interesting to see going forward. Um, I've had a couple of uh, collaboration meetings now where we get to see people working with the data for the first time. And it's always really exciting to see that you've created something that is going to help the entire community. Um, and of course the community has been very helpful this entire way. I couldn't have uh, done any of this without a strong community backing me. Um, anyway, that's all the slides I have. Uh, I don't know if I was talking really fast or really slow. Um, so thanks for listening. And if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, that, that was perfect. Um... I have a little question about the, so you have these data products, you have these data products that you have produced and people are going to use them for exciting things, like you said. Um, oh, it, what, how does it work or is there an agreement um, on attribution? For, um, for instance, if somebody writes a paper that includes all this, do you get to be a co-author? Desk has a pretty uh, strong uh, publication policy that handles author attribution. Um, in the case of my builder status, that means anyone who uses these images, I can conceivably add myself as an author on the paper. Um, so we really value infrastructure at the LSST desk. Uh, we want to make sure those people get credited even when we start moving on to science. Um, obviously, there are ethical limitations to that. If someone uses one image and that image barely contributes to the science, I'm not going to ask to be on the paper. Um, but we, we tried to make it so infrastructure people can get on papers um, as That's much great. as the science people. I see there's some hands. So I think, Haya, you're, you're first on uh, at least my screen. Cool. Yes. Uh, so uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, I wanted to explore um, your thoughts on the workflow node that you were talking about that you wish, you know, you wish if there were a workflow node um, that was more stable. Are there other requirements in that wish that you would like that doesn't go like for a single facility versus that the grand dream of you know multi-facility orchestration? What 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 would a workflow node look like to you for a facility? Um, so let me think about that. So with the understanding that I'm not really good at the hardware side, um, we would want really fast connections to compute nodes so that we don't get overloaded if we're running many small tasks all at once. Um, I could see that being a potentially an issue if you're trying to send, you know, millions of tasks in a short time for uh, various machine learning projects. Um, so you would want to be able to have uh, plenty of connections really fast with the compute nodes. Um, stability is my personal concern for these simulation efforts. We want to make sure that there's enough uh, availability on that node that um, trying to think of the word for this. Um, so the to go into the specific issue we had is when we were using compute resources on Theta actually, Theta has a, a biweekly maintenance. And what would happen um, is that we would have the biweekly maintenance happen, um, weird cycling of scheduling happen, and then one of our compute jobs suddenly start up before anyone woke up at, uh, uh, you know, four in the morning to uh, turn back on the parcel driver, just as a little bit of a hypothetical. Um, and so, so we ended up with situations where um, if something goes down and the driver, no one's around to get the driver back up immediately and work goes in, then suddenly you wasted a lot of queue time um, and the task does nothing, which is sad. Um, so stability is huge for, for that. Um, 
those are the two that come immediately to mind. Um, I imagine a workflow node would probably be a little more open to being used for minor compute. Um, just because like, for example, these bundling scripts, we want to be able to do, um, we run a single Python command to count how many objects are available on a sensor so that we don't simulate sensors with nothing on it. So we do run very small Python commands, um, but probably larger than you would want to run on a, a login node. Um, so those are the thoughts that come to me immediately at least. Okay, thanks. I think, I think Roland had his hand up and I was trying to lower Haya's hand and I might have accidentally lowered yours, Roland, I'm not sure. I, I think you lowered my hand. So. <laughs> well, you, you can virtually raise it again. So, well, can I just ask my question? Yes, please do. All right, okay. Uh, so uh, first off, congratulations on your builder status. I know that that's like one to two years of dedicated FTE work before you get that. Um, the question I had um, was the thing that you didn't address in the in the talk, but of course we have a new system that we're bringing up right now and it's full of GPUs. And so I had two questions for you. I know that MSIM is a NESAP project. And so um, Josh Myers is the developer on that has been working on a GPU port for that. And so um, were, were GPUs, I guess GPUs were not used at all in, in DC2 at all. And then is, is that true? And then in, will, would a future, I guess maybe a future one would, but then my second question is, we have all these GPUs and, and you generate a whole lot of simulated data. And you mentioned that there's like a project provided downstream pipeline for doing, um, you know, for people to test out their algorithms or whatever on it. But um, we have infrastructure for GPU enabled analytics at scale and I'm dying to find somebody who wants to like take a quarter of the machine and, you know, do some kind of, you know, clustering calculation over that in real time. And so are those kinds of workloads at all that kind of interactivity, is that of interest to anybody at all? Or, you know, is it, is it, um, is it just, are we just barking up the wrong tree trying to find people to do that? So it's a little complicated. Um, one thing I will say is that for the GPU side, I know the MSIM team is working on approaches that will be more suitable for using GPUs in the future. And I know that um, while LSST Desk might not have another major image simulation campaign, that we think this is going to be something that uh, is going to be used for more uh, telescopes in the future. We, do, we don't think it's going away, basically. Um, regarding the analysis workflow and using them on GPUs, um, I think the astrophysics community is sort of slowly starting to peel in that direction, but it's, um, I want to, the way I would put it is it's a little tricky. We tend to have things that require very large stacks of information. And so GPU calculations tend not to actually gain us too much, um, at least in the most naive approaches. Um, so we're still trying to figure out the best way to package together tasks to do that. Um, I know in particular, I'm working on a program with uh, um, Andrew Huron and Matt Becker to explore how to use uh, uh, GPU codes to do pair counting, which is a very common operation in sort of the uh, theory analysis that you need to do to make predictions about cosmology. And so we're trying to get that set up to work on GPUs. But I'm not sure if we're at the point where we'd be ready to scale up to a quarter of a machine. And I can't really speak to how soon that would be. Thanks. Uh, I see Debbie has her hand raised. Yeah, um, I'm curious about FOSIM. Um, is FOSIM being used at all by, by DESK? Would you know, is it being used by the project still? Um, I admittedly am bad about keeping track of what the project is doing because I don't have quite super strong connections with them. Um, and I don't actually know if Desk is using FOSIM anymore. I know when we went to DC2, we focused in on MSIM. Um, that decision was actually a little before my time of coming on, so I can't really speak to why that choice was made. Um, okay. But I haven't seen much FOSIM inside of the community. 
Yeah, I haven't heard much speak of that recently. I'm really just curious because back in the olden days when I worked in desk, uh, I was involved in FOSIM. So I was curious if that was still part of it. But yeah, it sound, I, I've, I've mainly heard about uh, IMSIM recently. Yeah, yeah. When I jumped into this project, it was still run 1.2 or something. And I remember seeing that we were still using some residual FOSIM for testing against. And, um, but from that point on, it sort of moved only into IMSIM. Again, I, I don't know the, the motivations behind that. All right, thank you. Okay, well, we're getting close to the end. I want to thank you again. And since I had, I want to thank Rollin for stepping in when I couldn't connect for whatever reason, I couldn't connect and he actually helped me out too. Um, I did have a couple of slides at the beginning, so I will do the beginning at the end and um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And mm -hmm. I will also do my slides backwards just to, uh, because it seems appropriate at this point. So I want to congratulate you again, Antonio, and remind people that Antonio is one of our winners of the, the Nurse High Performance Computing Achievement Awards. Um, and as you heard about, for developing innovative workflows to enable using HPC at scale in support of the LST desk uh, collaboration. So congratulations. And if you'll send me an address, we'll send you a framed copy of this Absolutely. certificate. Thank you. And. Um, if you need some additional time to do your work at, at Nurse this year or, or next, let me know and we can make um, some time available to your project. Yeah, sure thing, I'll keep that in mind. And then the previous slide to this would have been, except now I can't make it advance. So I'm just having, oh, there we go. And just to remind people that this is the first in a series. Um, so I think we're off to a really great start. Um, next week, we have David Vartanian from Berkeley uh, talking about supernova. And these will be every Wednesday through November 10th. And um, with that, I want to thank you again for joining, for everybody for joining us. And thank you, uh, Antonio. That was a great talk. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. Glad you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for listening. Okay. Uh, well, goodbye, everybody. Have a good rest of the day. And this, this will be recorded and we'll get it posted somewhere. Sure thing. Uh, okay. Have a good one. Okay. Bye.